And so we arrive at our Torah service with those prayers for peace in our minds. And we are at Parshat Mishpatim. And this is, a, so we're in the book of Exodus, right? We know that. And a lot of really big things have happened so far. We became slaves. It was bad. They tried to stop us from growing. All the babies had to go in the river, right? Slavery is terrible. It was hard work. Moses goes and he comes back and he tries to free us and all the plagues. Okay, so you've seen the Prince of Egypt. You've been watching. You're following along in the Daily Digest, Weekly Digest. And then last week, we have what is sort of the culmination of that entire Exodus story, it feels like, um, and definitely like the last scene of all of the movies that have been um, made about this experience, where Moses goes up the mountains and he gets the Ten Commandments. And in Parsha Yitro, there are these descriptions of thunder and lightning and drama and, uh, and, the, and the sound and the sights and the feeling and the earth moves and it trembles under them. And to imagine how terrifying that must have been is wild to think about. They've been slaves. They're just barely free. They don't know how to function outside of Egypt. They don't know, the people don't know how to, um, how to exist in this new iteration of their life. And they've just been subjected to like, this natural disaster feeling uh, experience. And so the imagination that, that they are wildly overwhelmed at this point is not hard to get to. And then... In this parsha, it begins with the words ve'ela mishpatim, and these are the rules that you're going to set before them. God's telling Moses, and then the rules get set before them. And this entire Torah portion contains rules, laws, instructions, more instructions, I think, than exist in most other parshas in the Torah, and it is a wild change. Like a hard left turn from what happened last week to what happens this week, where we're in the crazy story, not believing what we're reading or hearing about these mountains trembling. And then we get here and it's like, all right, here's the rules. And then it's a list of rules and it goes on for a very long time. And the rules are fascinating and they're important, but they are deeply not dramatic, right? It's a really big change from the feeling of last week to the feeling of this week. And in fact, this is the moment that the Torah shifts from how it has been up until now, which has been completely narrative, right? We start in the Garden of Eden, and then we have Noah, and then Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph, and then Egypt, and then Exodus. Those are all stories, stories that have characters, and emotion, and plot lines, and they begin, and they have a middle, and they have a resolution at the end, and then they go on to the next generation. We have been in Bible story land, and now we come out of that narrative into a completely different style. We are in instruction. We're in law giving. And it, if you were to read the whole thing through, even if you were just to read Exodus all the way through, you get to chapter 21 and the, the page turner quality of the Torah, if we want to call it that, certainly uh, drops off. Why? First of all, why would the Torah do that? I'm sure that there are plenty of stories, many of which we have a chance to participate in uh, hearing and reading as we navigate the rest of the Torah, but they are interspersed with moments of instruction, very detailed moments of instruction. How to build the tabernacle, more laws, how to enter the land of Israel, more laws, how to go to war, more laws, right? We learn all of these things, and in there, we get some of the narrative of those years of wandering and then stopping on the precipice of the banks of the River Jordan as they get ready to cross into the land of Israel. And it is so many rules. And then we repeat a lot of the rules in Deuteronomy in case we didn't have enough. 
So what, what is this? What is this change, this move from narrative to instructive? Well, there's a couple of theories that are out there. The first is that we ourselves as humans are in transition all the time. We are not ever the people that we were yesterday or last year or a decade ago. And as this Parsha starts out, it talks about first having a slave. Verse 2 in chapter 21 says, When you acquire a Hebrew slave, that person shall serve you for six years and then shall go free in the seventh year without payment. And the idea that, that we begin the rules with the concept of transition from slavery to freedom, just like we are in transition from slavery to freedom, just like we are all in the transition and the growing that happens to human beings means that this transition is relatable to us, that we understand it, that just like the slave that is being freed, we can see ourselves in that, even if we are not reading a story about a specific slave like we have been up until now. The second thing is that it makes it personal. It's about us. This is how we're supposed to behave. We just spent a whole hour in Torah study learning about how the, the verses in about 20 verses after that first and second verse talk about what happens um, in a case where two people get into a fight and a pregnant person is accidentally injured in that fight and it causes a miscarriage. And that conversation, those verses are the foundation of how most Jews, 83% of Jews in America as of 2015, feel about reproductive rights. That's fascinating that it is those stories, those laws, those rules that inform so much later how we feel about uh, the world and how we're supposed to act and behave in it. And so even though these rules feel less narrative and less like we can put ourselves into the story, perhaps they're even more about us because we can put ourselves into the situations and into the behavior. But actually, the explanation that I like the most is that the instruction doesn't mean anything without the story. That really the point of the Torah is to give us the rules that we need to know how to live, how to function. You can see that the Israelites are struggling to be a people. They are struggling to know what to do and how to believe and how to behave and how to belong. And they need the instruction. But without the story, it doesn't mean anything. That's what makes it important to us. We today take so seriously the imperative to love the stranger. We believe that. It has been a fundamental part of the conversation that we've had in the last few weeks after Colleyville. What does it mean to love the stranger, to welcome the stranger? What's the cost? And how do we reconcile the cost and the imperative? And yet that sentence doesn't exist on its own, which is why it's so important to us. It doesn't just say love the stranger. It says love the stranger for you yourself were a stranger in the land of Egypt. And once we know that and we know that it was us, we can't ignore it. And so the story is what makes it important to us. A book of rules is just a book of rules. That's why people love watching Hamilton so much, is because the story of how this country came to be, even this version of it, the story of who these people were and how they existed and how they came to find these freedoms to be so important is what makes them so important because we know what they were running from and what they were fighting for. And so too, we know what we were, where we were, and what we became. And so it makes the rules important, the instructions important. And so even as we sense a shift in the Torah from this week forward, in the way that we are going to find these big, enormous moments get smaller, starting now and moving all the way through the Torah and into the rest of Jewish history, we know that that is our foundation and that we are there in the drama and in the theater so that we can also be here in the day-to-day -day and finding out how these rules play a role in our life and how we treat everyone as we walk through this world. Shabbat shalom.